Good morning. Good morning. Welcome all of you, especially our visitors who are worshiping with us this morning on the sixth Sunday after Epiphany. The theme of the week is indicated by our first hymn as we are always watching and praying so that we're not led into temptation to sin, but rather that we struggle against the sinful desires that we have within us and flee from our sin. We'll follow the order of service printed in your worship folder. God's blessings on your worship this morning. of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. 
we have come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you the strength to live according to his will. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, in mercy receive the prayers of your people. Give them the wisdom to know the things that please you and the grace and power always to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. Please follow along with our scripture readings for today. For our first lesson, we turn to 2 Samuel, reading selected verses there in chapter 11. The familiar account of David uh, looking upon Bathsheba and then lusting after her and having her husband killed. For he was not really thinking about what God would have him do in that situation, but rather follow his own desires. Springtime arrived, the time when kings go out to war. David sent Joab out with his officers and with all Israel. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David stayed in Jerusalem. One evening, David had gotten up from his couch and was walking around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very good looking. David sent to inquire about the woman, and he was told, Isn't this Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? David sent messengers to bring her. She came to him, and he lay down with her. She had been purifying herself from her ceremonial uncleanness. She then returned to her house. The woman became pregnant, so she sent a message and told David, I'm pregnant. David sent a message to Joab, send Uriah the Hittite to me. So Joab sent Uriah to David and Uriah came to him. David asked how Joab and the troops were doing and how the war effort was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. When Uriah went out of the palace, the king sent a gift to him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all the servants of his master. He did not go down to his own house. David was informed, Uriah has not gone down to his house. So David said to Uriah, haven't you come a long distance? Why didn't you go down to your house? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are living in shelters. And my master Joab and the servants of my master are camped on the bare ground in the open countryside. Should I go to my house to eat and to drink 
and to lie down with my wife? By your life, as surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to Uriah, Stay here today also. Tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. David summoned him, and Uriah ate as his guest, and David got him drunk. But in the evening he went and slept on his mat where the servants of his master were. He did not go to his own house. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab, and he sent it in the hands of Uriah. In the letter, he wrote, Station Uriah opposite the fiercest fighting. Then withdraw from behind him so that he will be struck down and die. So when Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew that the enemy's strongest warriors were. The men of the city came out and fought against Joab, and some of the troops of David fell. Uriah the Hittite also died. The wife of Uriah the Hittite heard that her husband was dead, so she mourned for her husband. When her mourning was completed, David sent for her and brought her to his house, and she became his wife. She gave birth to a son for him, but what David had done was evil in the eyes of the Lord. This is the word of our God. We turn now in the front of the hymnal and sing the first part of Psalm 119. Our second lesson is recorded in Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, reading there the first 12 verses of chapter 4, as the apostle encourages us to walk in a way that is pleasing to God. Therefore, beyond this, brothers, just as you received instructions from us about how you are to walk so as to please God, as indeed you are doing, 
we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that you do so even more. To be sure, you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Indeed, this is God's will, that you be sanctified, namely that you keep yourselves away from sexual immorality. He wants each of you to learn to obtain a wife for yourself in a way that is holy and honorable, not in lustful passion like the heathen who do not know God. No one is to overstep and take advantage of his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, just as we said previously and solemnly testified to it. For God did not call us for uncleanness, but in sanctification. Consequently, whoever rejects this is not rejecting a man, but the God who gives you his Holy Spirit. Concerning brotherly love, there is no need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God, with the result that you love one another. In fact, you are doing so toward all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we encourage you, brothers, to do this even more, and to make it your ambition to live a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands, just as we instructed you. Do this so that you are conducting yourselves decently toward outsiders, and are not lacking anything. This is the word of our Lord. We join in the verse of the day. Savior in his words, please stand for the reading of our gospel. Our gospel lesson continues our readings from the gospel of St. Matthew. We read in chapter 5, beginning at verse 21, as Jesus continues his Sermon on the Mount with instructions and commands concerning our lives. You have heard it was said to people long ago, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that everyone who is angry with his brother without a cause will be subject to judgment. And whoever says to his brother Rika will have to answer to the Sanhedrin. But whoever says, you fool, will be in danger of hellfire. So if you are about to offer your gift at the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. If someone accuses you, reach an agreement with him quickly while you are with him on the way. Otherwise, your accuser may bring you to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you will be thrown into prison. Amen, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to fall into sin, pluck it out and throw it away from you. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. 
If your right hand causes you to fall into sin, cut it off and throw it away from you. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, causes her to be regarded as an adulteress. And whoever marries the divorced woman is regarded as an adulterer. Again, you have heard it was said to people long ago, do not break your oaths, but fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, not by heaven, because it is God's throne, and not by earth, because it is his footstool, and not by Jerusalem, because it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your own head, since you cannot make one hair white or black. Instead, let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Whatever goes beyond these is from the evil one. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. This time we'll have our children's message. You may come up to the front. In the Bible, God's Word, He tells us what we should do and not do. They're called God's commandments. Let's just, take, let's just take one of the commandments. It's number four. God says, honor your father and your mother. So honor mom and dad, love mom and dad, do everything that mom and dad tells you to do. Do you follow that commandment all the time? You might not believe this, but I was your age one time, Joe. When I was your age, I didn't follow that commandment all the time. Either. The reason for that is our hearts kind of look like this. Now, I don't, I don't mean the muscle inside of your body, but what's inside of us. They're not always really healthy. That heart doesn't look really healthy. And inside of that heart is a face that's frowning, not smiling, doesn't look very happy, doesn't look like it really wants to do what God commands. There's still a part of us that's like that all the time. God says, do this, and a part of us says, I'm never going to do that, because sin lives inside of us. We are so thankful all the time that Jesus died on the cross to take away our sins. God forgives us for all the times when we don't want to do what God says. What we need to do all the time is keep receiving God's word, listening to the news about Jesus' love for us and the forgiveness we have. We want to keep reminding ourselves that Christ gives us strength in our hearts to do what he says. And then our hearts are more and more like this. With Jesus in our hearts, our hearts are strong. And it's not a frowning face, but it's a smiling face. With Jesus in our hearts as we receive God's word, we more and more want to do what God says, and we find more joy in following God's commands. So let's all of us keep receiving God's word gladly and hearing the message of God's love for us, everything Jesus did for us, and then every day more and more we will do what God says. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we know that we sin against you every day because we still have sin in our hearts. We thank you that you don't send us to hell for our sins, but you forgive us. 
and promise us a place in heaven. Give us strength every day, more and more, to do what you say. We pray in your name. Amen. Thank you, children. You may go back to your seats. gave his life for us, and was raised again. Dear friends in Christ, in our Lord's Sermon on the Mount, from the Gospel of Matthew, he has much to tell us. The Gospel lessons in our worship cycle from the past few Sundays had excerpts from the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus spoke his blessings. He spoke how we and all who trust in him are blessed as we believe in Jesus and follow him. He reminded us about our special role. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. And now today in the Gospel lesson, Jesus teaches us about true obedience. What is right and what is wrong? What kind of obedience does God require? As we all know, God tells us what is right and what is wrong, and he requires an obedience that's not merely on the surface, but it comes deep down from our hearts. This morning we listen to Jesus in this part from his Sermon on the Mount give us instruction about true obedience. Jesus teaches us to obey him from the heart. He teaches us from three of the commandments, at least in part, from three of the commandments. The fifth commandment, you shall not murder. The sixth commandment, you shall not commit adultery. And the second commandment, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Let's take up what our Savior teaches in the order of the commandments. So we'll start with the second commandment. And Jesus teaches us, under the second commandment, all about swearing. Swearing is 
taking an oath in God's name, calling on God as your witness to back up the truthfulness of what you are saying or to stand behind what you are about to do. Swearing is something serious to do, isn't it? The reality is that sinful people often misuse God's name by swearing. The Jews of Jesus' time had some practices with swearing. Instead of speaking God's name, they would take oaths by other things, like heaven, or earth, or Jerusalem. Sometimes they would also make fine distinctions in their oaths. They would take oaths by the temple, but unless they specifically swore by the gold in the temple, then that oath, then that oath really didn't apply anymore. You can imagine how confusing that would be living back then. When exactly did an oath apply? What did all of that do for God's name? All of that kind of oath-taking dishonored God's holy name. Today, people probably don't have such fine distinctions about oaths. Instead, people so often speak oaths to cover up lies. Or people speak oaths in situations where you really don't need to swear an oath. It really is not necessary at all. Jesus instructs us to obey him from the heart when it comes to this kind of activity. We want to honor God's name because God's name is precious to us. God's name is everything we know about him as revealed in the Bible. And we know so much about him. His many acts of love and mercy in creating the universe, in providing us with what we need from day to day, and in the greatest way by giving his son to die for us and to claim us as his own for life now and for eternity. God's name is precious and valuable to us. So we don't want to say anything or do anything that will dishonor God's holy name. So we should be very careful about swearing, about taking oaths. We should do away with all unnecessary swearing. Really, we only might swear in the most serious of circumstances. If you are ever called upon to testify in a court of law, maybe some of you have had this kind of occasion, and you are put under oath, well then, you would swear by God to tell the truth. The Apostle Paul, in some of his letters in the New Testament, would very occasionally, rarely take an oath, but only to back up his authenticity as an apostle of Jesus in preaching the gospel. Otherwise, except for very rare and serious occasions, we don't need to be swearing. That's why Jesus says, just say yes, just say no, and that should be enough. Christ commands us to live such lives of integrity that when we say yes, people believe us, and when we say no, people believe us. No unnecessary oath taking. We want to honor God's name from our hearts. And to do so, we also pray to God. We praise Him. We thank Him. We tell others about the great God that we have and in whom we trust. We gather in God's house. We worship Him. That honors His name from our hearts in everything. We want to follow this commandment from God by honoring God's holy and precious name. Now, the fifth commandment is taught us by Jesus. God's fifth commandment protects his precious gift of life. We are not to hurt our neighbor. We are not to do anything to cause emotional hurt for our neighbor in deeds or in words. And this is where Jesus especially instructs us in the fifth commandment when he addresses the whole matter of anger. Anger all by itself is not a sin. We say this because God himself 
gets angry. God is holy. God is righteous. God never ever sins in any way at all. He practices what is truly righteous anger. It's possible for us to also practice a righteous kind of anger where we are angry at sin. Anger, angry at sin in us. Angry at sin around us. But this is the problem. And it is a serious problem. It is so difficult for us to get angry, even to practice righteous anger without sinning. Because our flesh inside of us so easily gets a hold of us and causes us to feel hostility and hatred when we get angry. The Bible says that man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Let me ask you, when you get angry, do you really feel happy? Probably not. When you think back to moments when you became angry and you expressed your anger to somebody else, are those, are those moments from the past that you cherish? Probably not. Our anger produces often strife and conflict and hurt, and the anger that we express in words sometimes spills over into anger that, that we might actually show in, in deeds and in actions. And worst of all, Jesus warns us against words that are spoken in anger. Jesus says, Whoever says to his neighbor, you fool, will be in danger of hellfire. Doesn't that statement from Jesus almost take your breath away? Which of us can say, I have never spoken a word in anger to somebody else? We pray to Christ, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And graciously, he forgives. So how should we deal with anger, which almost all the time in us is sinful? We should control it. The fact is, as Jesus teaches us in other parts of the scriptures, we are able to control ourselves. God gives us power as his, as his children to control things like anger. The Bible says, sin shall not be your master. So when we have those feelings that start to well up inside of us, as, as we, we disagree with somebody else, and, and we feel like expressing ourselves in anger, God's Spirit has control over us, and we as people of God can control our anger. So we, we stop it right at the source. Jesus also teaches us, instead of getting angry with others and causing strife and conflict, we should do our very best to reconcile with others. And Jesus puts it in terms of the worship life of people of his day. He says, if you're at the temple and you're offering an animal for sacrifice, which, which was God-pleasing, it was a way to honor God by offering a sacrifice, and if you're there offering your sacrifice and you remember that somebody has something against you that's causing conflict, leave your sacrifice there. Go find your neighbor and, and reconcile at once. Jesus so much stresses for us that we should not let conflict linger so that it leads then to words spoken in anger and other sin. Take action. Take action now, Jesus instructs us, to put away whatever might become contentious and a source of anger. And we can do that, and we do that, because every one of us is reconciled to God through Christ. God is not angry at us because of our sins. He has put them all away. He does not count them against us because of the blood of Jesus. So, so we can, and we do, reconcile with others whenever we have conflicts. No anger, Jesus teaches us, but reconciliation. In this part of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus addresses one more common sin, the sin of lust. The world around us and the culture in which we live pretty much views lust as 
harmless. The culture around us, the world in which we live, really says, well, you can have these kinds of these sexual desires in your mind and your heart as much as you want, as often as you want, as, as long as you don't act on them, as long as you don't force them on somebody else. You can look at whatever you want, it's usually probably okay, as long as you don't act on it. Is that what our Lord Jesus teaches us? Whoever looks at a woman with lustful intent has committed adultery with her in his heart. Do we notice what Jesus does here? He equates lustful thoughts, sexually immoral impulses in our hearts, with the open act of adultery. It brings guilt before God. It is wrong before the holy God. To make the point about this sin and all other sins of the heart, Jesus speaks in very strong language here, doesn't he? If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it out. It is better for you to enter heaven with one eye and with one hand than to be thrown into hell with both eyes and both hands. Now our Lord Jesus is not literally teaching us to cut off parts of our bodies and to gouge out our eyes. The fact is, if, if we would do away with all sins of the heart and of the mind, we'd have to remove our hearts and we'd have to remove our brains. What Jesus is doing here is speaking in hyperbole, making as clear to us as he possibly can just how dangerous sins of the heart and the mind really are. Bottom line from Jesus, do not lust. Do not commit sins of the heart and of the mind. So what does Jesus command instead? He commands purity. Purity in our hearts and purity in our minds. Again, we have power from the Holy Spirit to practice self-control. Sins of the heart and the mind like lust don't need to get control of us and carry us away because as the Bible says, sin shall not be your master. We have the fruit of the Spirit, self-control, so that we guard and defend ourselves against these kinds of sins. Instead of impure thoughts, we are to have pure thoughts. The scriptures say to us, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy, Think about these kinds of things. We guard ourselves against images that come across the television screen, the computer monitor, and our smartphones that can lead us into having lustful thoughts and committing acts of sexual immorality against Christ. And instead, we fill our minds with what is good and right and pure. Jesus also, as he instructs us in the Sixth Commandment, wants us who are married to live out marriage in love. God himself instituted marriage in the beginning, one man, one woman bound together in marriage for life. So Jesus teaches us in the Sermon on the Mount here, don't divorce. If you're married, don't divorce, but stay together because that is God's good and gracious will. The Lord does concede that sometimes, sadly, a person in marriage commit sexual immorality, and that could very well spell the end of the marriage. Yet, the sins of people do not negate God's design that one man and one woman who marry stay together for life and, and love one another from the heart and obey Christ from the heart with, with husbands selflessly leading the marriage and wives selflessly helping their husbands in accordance with God's will. For marriage. Jesus instructs us to obey him from the heart in all matters related to the sixth commandment. This is what Jesus teaches us about obedience from the heart. Let's remember who's teaching us. Our Savior. The one who's teaching us is the same one who throughout his life here on the earth always obeyed his father from
from the heart. No unnecessary always. No words spoken in anger with hatred behind them. No lustful thoughts. In everything that Jesus thought and said and did, he followed God's holy will for us. And then our loving Savior took all of our sins, the sins that strike us here in this part of the Sermon on the Mount, the sins that we're aware of as we remember all of God's Ten Commandments, he took all those sins on himself, he carried them to the cross, he paid the price of his blood to wash us clean and to reconcile us to God. Our Lord Jesus, who teaches us how to obey from the heart, truly loves us. And so, filled with his love for us, let's obey Christ from the heart. Amen. Please stand. Let's join together in confessing the facts of our Christian faith as they are summarized in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into heaven. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father of Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. I ask the newer members please to step forward. Would the rest of you please go into your service folders and find this wheat-colored half sheet for our new member welcome. You can slide a little bit that way so the minions can take a spot over there. Dear friends in Christ and God's word, we find Christ's church described in many interesting terms. Here are several. The bride of Christ, the body of Christ, a holy nation, and the people of God. These, term indicate, these terms indicate to us that Jesus has shown us his grace and made us a privileged people. We should also understand that we have a high purpose to fulfill. At Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church, we have stated our purpose as a congregation in our congregational mission statement, and it reads as follows. Uniting us in the worship of the triune God, Christ gives us our mission to proclaim the gospel in order to make disciples throughout the world and to nurture them for lives of service. Are you committed to pursuing this purpose with us as fellow members of Trinity? If so, answer as a group. With Christ's help, we are. We thank Jesus for your membership in Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church and encourage you, along with us, to keep receiving the gospel and word and sacrament. Today we publicly and officially welcome you as members of our congregation. I'm going to ask you now to turn around so others can see you. This, this is a friendly audience. And I'll introduce you starting from what is your right? We have uh, Tom and Kendall and Throms, their children, Matthias and Hazel, right here in front of me now. We have the Newmans, Matthew and Jennifer, their children, Amelia and Jack. Right in the middle, Clayton Lester. And then next, the Rodies, Bruce and Patty Rody. The Furches, uh, you know Pastor Furch well, so Pastor George and Nan Furch. And then on the very end here, the Cudnell Houskies, Cameron and Ashley Cudnells. To the rest of you gathered here, I ask, do you receive these new members as brothers and sisters in Christ? Yes, we welcome you into our Christian family. We promise to show you Christian love and encouragement as we ask you to do for us. Let's 
Let's all pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for our congregation of believers in you. We praise you for working through your gospel to unite us together. Bless these new members as they grow in faith in you. Bind us all together in your love so that we continue to love one another. In your name we pray. Amen. To our new, to our new, there are newer members. May you experience God's rich blessings as members of our Trinity congregation. And may you, through our congregation, be a blessing to many others. May the blessings of the Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and, and remain with you always. Go in peace. You may return to your seat. We will have a reception for them between services starting right after the service. All of you are invited to attend. It will be out in the fireside room. We'll now gather our offerings for the Lord. Please stand for prayer. Almighty Father, heaven and earth with lavish wealth before you bow. Those treasures owe to you their birth, so richly furnished for us now. We, Lord, would lay at your request the costliest offerings on your shrine. And when we give and give our best, we but return your gifts divine. Amen. But you join me in the response of prayer of the church printed in your worship folder. When we come to the special prayers, we'll include a prayer for Mr. Gustafson as he deliberates his call to Seminole, Florida. We pray. Lord God, our maker and preserver, we praise and thank you for all that you give us day after day. We are not worthy of all the mercies you show us. You have given us your precious word to nourish our souls and to protect us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. Heavenly Father, we pray that you shield us from every kind of danger, sudden catastrophe, terrors of crime, and the pain of disease. Watch over those who travel by land, sea, and air. Keep our loved ones from whatever perils may threaten them.
Bless our land, our people, and those who hold offices of high trust. Keep our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations, that we may enjoy your gifts of peace, security, and well-being. Lord Jesus, you instituted the office of the public ministry and have given your people the privilege of extending calls to serve them through that ministry. According to your good and gracious will, Mr. Gustafson has received a call to serve at Bay Pines Lutheran School in Seminole, Florida. We ask that as he prayerfully considers this call, you would guide him to a decision that is in the best interest of your kingdom. Give him confidence in your promises as he depends on you, the Lord of the church. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. We bring these requests before you in the name of Jesus, our Lord, and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, our ministries and offerings, and use them to your glory. Protect and comfort us in all temptation, and bestow on us your saving peace through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers, sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Please be seated.